Hi, everyone. I hope lunch was to your liking. I hope the breakout sessions were great. I got to attend a, a couple of them. And um, the only problem with the breakout sessions that we're hearing is there's so much great talent um, and great conversation to choose from. So it's hard to choose which one you want to go to. But um, I hope you're enjoying the experience so far. Uh, and I know you're going to enjoy our next speech. Before getting to that, though, um, we do want to give you some updates on a couple things. So Project Exchange, which is uh, going to showcase the winners of our project fair, um, has projects on dis display now. And they will be on display until 4 o'clock. And there is voting for those projects. So please do go and check out the implementations in those projects and uh, put your vote in. Uh, the ideas and research track also wanted to mention that tomorrow there's an informal uh, series of mentorship meetups. So there's no sign up. You can go and join in. Uh, and that's between students and faculty. So please get involved, share your ideas, and uh, meet potential collaborators. So I'm honored to introduce uh, Margaret Levy, uh, who's going to give you a sense for something that's extremely important to Radical Exchange, which is we need to ask the normative questions um, in addition to the positive ones when we think about new economic models. Um, and, and firstly, recognizing that. But then once you recognize that, um, where, where, you know, where do you start and where do you take that? And so Margaret is the director of the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences at Stanford. She is a professor at politi uh, of political science at Stanford. And a professor emerita of international studies in the Department of Political Science at the University of Washington. She's the author or co-author of new, numerous articles and seven books on matters involving the importance of a political relative to economic factors, which is inherent to political economy. Um, and that includes production policies um, and also the influence of moral values in workplaces and political bodies. And so, as I mentioned, her speech, Generating a New Moral Political Economy, relates to work uh, that she's doing, and actually her team is doing at the Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences at Stanford on developing a new moral political economic framework. Uh, and a question that um, I'm personally very excited to hear about, how do we design a moral political economy behind, be, beyond the post-World War II order that we're so familiar with? So please help me in welcoming Margaret Levy. Okay, I am a, not a comedian, <laughs> so that's the first thing I want to tell you. <laughs> it's hard competition to follow. I'm a political economist um, who really does think about the role of politics and institutions in when we think about social change and political and economic change. And I unfortunately wish I could, but I can't provide answers to some of the questions and issues that I'm going to raise. But hopefully I can generate some thinking about those that will animate discussions as they go forward at this meeting and um, discussions as they go forward in other kinds of venues. I'm also going to emphasize some history, because I think it's important. I'll start with the present, but I'm going to emphasize some historical cases, the kind of comparative historical economic, political economic work I do really draws on instances in history where institutions varied and changed and had consequences for very different kinds of um, behaviors, political uh, ideas, et cetera. Okay. So one of the things we know, and there's lots of evidence of, is that the political economic framework that really defined the post-World War II era is fraying. We can see it through protests on the streets, through votes, those are among the indicators that something's going on. The general discontent with the liberal consensus um, on globalization practices is another, and I'm sure many of us have been involved in um, globalization demonstrations to encourage rights for more people. With unraveling of the order comes contestation of the values that undergird that framework and an antagonism against those who are seen as violating the implicit social contract. And here's an example of the Black Lives Matter movement. But equally 
Another version of this is the radical right and their protest. Both are feeling like the values that are being um, represented by the current system are not reflecting their own. What we need is a new moral political economy and a new framework for doing that. And I'm going to focus here on some of the pieces that we need to make that happen. Citizen confidence in government, trustworthy government, and legitimacy, and try to explain and build on those pieces a bit, and make some distinctions that I hope are useful. Uh, this is some of my work that will inform what I'm going to say. Um, and part of what I want to emphasize here is that it's not enough to look at attitudes and opinions. We also need to look at behaviors. We need to look at both. And we need to look at behaviors that aren't just voting behaviors or those kinds of actions. We need to look in the streets, the ways in which people are organizing their lives in a variety of ways, as well as various forms of non-compliance, what James Scott calls weapons of the weak. And I'm a big believer in looking at those weapons of the weak and trying to recognize what they're telling us about how people feel about the polity. So the normal way of thinking about trust in government is by looking at these kinds of surveys. And if I hear, and, and one of the real problems with this, we're hearing all the time that trust in government has gone down. I think there's reason to believe it has, but not because of these surveys, what these surveys tell us. These surveys are a relatively short duration of the history of any country. We didn't even have the survey methodology until sometime in the 19, late 1940s, early 1950s. In fact, my center was built on the fact that these kinds of methodologies were coming into play. Um, and the questions that they ask are very problematic. I'm not going to go into detail here, but feel free to take me aside at some point and I can tell you why I have problems with the trust questions in these surveys. But we see other evidence and other surveys showing us that not only has trust in government plummeted, but also trust in a variety of other institutions. This one's on media, and it's international. So it's happening to other institutions, whatever it is. And that's part of what we have to parse. So the problem with some of the surveys and with some of the presumptions that this is that, that what people are saying is really telling us what's going on is the perceptions are often flawed at particularly of how well government is doing. And so part of the trust in gov distrust in government is coming from a misunderstanding of what's actually happening. So people say there's a big problem with law and order. And in fact, at least in the US, the crime rate, the violent crime rate, has significantly declined um, since the 90s, for some good reasons, for some bad reasons. OK, so the concepts I'm going to emphasize here are trustworthy government, quasi-voluntary compliance, and contingent consent. They're related concepts that I've developed in some of the work that I've done that really speak to the ways in which people respond to government. Um, they quasi-voluntarily comply, if, like to taxes. If you don't comply, you will get punished. If you're caught, there's a rule in place. Sometimes they volunteer for the military, even when there's no conscription. That would be something I would call contingent consent. Their actions are demonstrating some form of consent. But I also want to get into another set of concepts which have to do with legitimating beliefs. And as I said, I'm going to draw on history to deal with this. OK, so if we think of the sources of government legitimacy, and here I'm, I'm a little out of line with some of the discussions that have been going on that I've heard. I actually believe that government has an important role to play. I don't want everything to be decentralized. <laughs> um, I want some things to be, but not everything to be. And I do think that in the places where there's confidence in government all the way through, it often starts with government, with government behaving well, demonstrating that it has administrative competence, demonstrating that it can deliver the goods and services that people actually want, that it does so fairly, so that it shows that it's effective and that it's fair according to the standards of the time and the place. There's no absolute standard of fairness. John Rawls, I bow to you, but there aren't. Um, and when we have those things, you're likely to create something that uh, 
Tom Tyler and Audrey Sachs and I have called value-based legitimacy or legitimating beliefs. And that's that the government is acting according to shared values in addition to being a good a performer and acting fairly. And that then leads to behavioral legitimacy or consent and compliance, which then in a virtuous circle can return and enable government to do more things that are good. So it, there's a relationship here between trustworthy government and legitimacy. Trustworthy government is probably, at least in the democratic polities, a necessary but not sufficient condition for legitimacy. So I would actually argue that government has remained, even some of those governments which are suffering from the biggest populist uh, backlashes, both from the right and the left, um, ha are actually still relatively trustworthy by these kinds of criteria. They're still relatively competent, they're still relatively effective, um, and they act according to norms of procedural justice, but they've lost legitimacy for either because of electoral problems or because certain people aren't being served very well or because the government's values and the popular values are out of line, which is a big part of the story. Okay, what I want to talk about now is I'm going to get into a little bit of the history and I'm going to talk about some, uh, I'm going to talk about some conscript referenda on conscription. These happened in two countries that I've studied, Australia and Canada. Um, and they tell us something about perceptions of whether government is untrustworthy or not, uh, because it's breaking promises in some cases but also in some conditions whether government is illegitimate because it's not upholding the shared values and principles and in some cases the constitution of those particular governments. Now I have problems with, and, and these cases will show a little bit about why referenda can sometimes be problematic. I mean, they're, how the referendum is framed, uh, the nuances of the situation, all of those can have all kinds of consequences. Referenda, unlike in Brexit, can also be ignored, uh, which is what happened in the Australia case. It was, the referenda was against conscription, the government went out of power, and then was re-elected and instituted conscription. Okay. So here's a case, this is Australia and First World War. These are some posters around the conscription campaign. And you can see that these are really, a, women had the vote in Australia. They had the vote since the first day and they were, there was a big appeal to women's vote in this particular campaign. So these were the, these were the, the people who were very pro-conscription. And as you can see, um, they're arguing that women should be there at the guns. They can really bring this home if they will just vote for conscription. And these are people who believed or were appealing to those who believed that government is trustworthy and conscription legitimate in the case of World War I. Here's the anti-conscription campaign also appealing to uh, women with a famous poem on the blood vote and how are you really gonna send your, your sons and husbands out to be fodder for a class war? So this was, uh, this was an argument that government was breaking certain promises, um, that it, it really, part of the opposition came from um, the Irish part of the community who felt like they were not being treated very well, and by the working class, who really didn't have confidence that government would um, treat them equally within the, in the army, and, and that the war itself was very problematic, that it was an imperialist war. There was a lot of ideology going in here. Um, so there was also a question of the legitimacy of the war. So there were questions about the trustworthiness of government and questions about the legitimacy of the war. Now I'm going to fast forward to Canada, which had two referenda, one for World War I and a second one in World War II, but they rewrote it in World War II, so it had a better chance of passing. They learned how to write a referenda. Um, but you can see that the vote on conscription 
was really uh, split between Francophone and Anglophone Canada. Anglophone Canada came out for conscription. Um, Francophone Canada almost to a person, except for the Fran Anglophones living in Francophone Canada, <laughs> uh, voted against conscription. Now, the Francophones had a long history of losing confidence in government, in finding it not trustworthy. They had been promised equal schools. They'd been promised that their language would be valued equally with that of the Anglophones. They were promised a variety of benefits that they never received. So they were not confident the government was trustworthy. It was violating norms of procedural fairness as they understood it, as well as what had been agreed when Canada became a country and consolidated the Francophone and the Anglophone parts. But they also thought the war itself was legitimate. The Canadian Constitution says you cannot have a war unless you're being attacked. And the argument that the Anglophones made was Britons be attacked. Mother Britain is being attacked. And they said to the Francophones, don't you feel that way about Mother France? And they said, what do you mean? France left us on the ice floes in the 17th century and then had a revolution and changed the religion. We have no, and they don't like our, the way we talk. So I, I, oh good, I got you to laugh. <laughs> I, I promised somebody in this audience I would try to make people laugh at some point in this talk. Um, and it's of course over blood votes. Um, <laughs> So the, the Francophones voted down conscription, right? They did not see the government as trustworthy or legitimate. I'm gonna now change totally <laughs> and go to some labor unions that I've studied because they allow us to get a different kind of uh, leverage on this set of questions. In fact, if you look at the history of my writing, one book leads to a set of questions that the next book tries to answer. So I always end with questions. And the question that was in the book on, that dealt with conscription and voluntary service really was wh what makes us different? What, how do we create this kind of um, willingness to act on behalf of government and the state and conditions under which we don't? So I looked at this question by looking with uh, co-author John Alquist um, looked at this question by looking at four different labor unions. I should confess that at this, the time when I started doing this work and got interested in this, I was the Harry Bridges Chair in Labor Studies. This is Harry Bridges. Um, Harry Bridges was a famous waterfront worker who organized the International Longshore Warehouse Union, which is the west coast part of the longshore. So reds and rackets, as another friend wrote a book, the rackets were on the East Coast, the reds were on the West Coast. Um, and they were very similar to the Longshore Union in Australia. So we looked at four unions in the transport sector, effectively many states, many governments, um, that were democratic, but with a range of democratic practices, some with uh, more participation, some with a lot less, some with far more corrupt practices, so the uh, East Coast Longshore were very corrupt. There certainly was a problem with the Teamsters. Um, and then you have the ILWU and the Maritime Union of Australia, which were, there might have been minor corruptions within the union, but they were largely very clean. But they also had very different models of government, which made them extremely trustworthy, the leadership particularly, and the, and the way in which the unions were, were organized as being very trustworthy, which is at that instead of being economic rent seekers, which was how the constitution of those other two unions that I mentioned were set up, I'm the leader, you pay me, I get you better wages, working conditions, benefits, and it's a contract, right? But I make money off of it, or I get lots of power and get asked to be Secretary of Labor or whatever as a result of running that union. In, the, in these two longshore unions, it was political rent seeking. We're gonna create a structure that really gives you, you as members a lot of power over me. Fairly easy recall, 
direct election in terms of voting up or down a contract as opposed to through a representative system as it was in the others, and lots of room for challenge. So one of the great traditions of the longshore workers, these are all men, yes, because it was basically a male union. I, its gender problems are coming another day, and we, that can be a separate discussion. But they had a tradition of hitting the mic. People lined up to challenge the leadership, to raise questions, to make proposals. And then there was a back and forth discussion about certain things. Now what's really interesting about these unions and what I really want to emphasize is not only were they trustworthy, one, they made things open and transparent and fair, and there was a whole way in which work was allocated that was unbelievably created an equitable distribution of income, but they also delivered on the goods, so they were effective. They had high performance standards and they met them. But they were also legitimate in that they helped shape and create and share the values of the membership and reflected those in what they did and how they acted. And here's where I'm gonna really get into the, the, the thing that's most important to me, is that what they were able to do is able to change beliefs of the members about what the world was like and what they could do about the world they were in. So let me give you a concrete example of that. One pensioner followed us out in um, Australia and said, you know, I was a big fan of Jim Healy, um, who was the head of the union. And he used to come to the bar and he used to sing Irish songs and he was one of us, but I never got his communism stuff, so I didn't buy that. But I have to tell you, when we were sitting one day on the wharf, eating lunch, having a meeting, a stop work meeting, and some of the leadership came up and said, look at those ships over there. Those ships are going to Indonesia. And they are Dutch ships and they're carrying armaments. And there's a revolution in Indonesia. And those ships are to put down the revolution. And everybody on the wharf said, that's not fair dinkum. We're not doing that. And they could, they could act, one, they learned something about the world that they were in and what the, these things were doing that they were just loading. They now knew where they were going, what they were doing. They had information they didn't have before. So it changed their understanding of the world that they were in, and they had efficacy. Now, that union was able to give them efficacy because they could refuse to load the ships, right? We heard an example of that the other day where the Longshore refused to load the ships for a single day on the west coast of the U.S. for a particular cause, but these a lot of what they did, and they didn't do it every day, but a lot of the times when they acted like this, there are certain things to keep in mind about it. These were costly actions. They could have lost their jobs, they could have been arrested, some of them were, some of them did. They certainly lost days of pay for the number of days that they refused to load the ships before the ships would leave unloaded. They were successful in doing that. It also created in them what I'm calling John and I call, I think in the next slide, an expanded community of fate. They were acting on behalf of distant others who could never reciprocate with them. They believed that there but for the grace of God go I. So they acted in solidarity with people who were not their mates who were not their family. We all have a community of fate, those in, with whom we share our destiny. I put this up in words so you didn't think I was talking about religion. Um, this is fate, a shared destiny, right? Um, so they really take into account and act on the, other, on the interest of others, which is the title of our book. So that is really what we came to try to explain and to understand. And that was created by a combination of institutional arrangements that allowed people to deliberate, to learn, to challenge, and by a leadership that was committed to that. But the institutional arrangements were crucial. Harry Bridges died, Big Jim Healy died, and yet the culture of that, those unions continued, and through big technological changes like containerization. They're suffering now because of legal changes and because of, of other technological changes, the digital 
revolution has made a huge difference to this because young men and women now can say, why do I have to go into the, to the, sh into the union hall to get my assignment? I, you can just text it to me. Right? We don't have to be there and interacting with each other, and that affects it. So there's a social piece of this that's very important. Okay, that leads me, that's the background for really thinking about how institutional arrangements and politics can really um, help us in thinking about a new moral political economy, one that really makes its values explicit. So here's one of the reasons I'm showing both of these people is that it reminds us that political economies change. Since the birth of capitalism, we've had multiple frameworks that have governed capitalism. And all of them have been moral political economies. Some of them, I think, are immoral political economies, but, that's, but they have values that are a part of them. Free to choose, uh, liberty, clearly very much part of how Hayek and Friedman thought. But we need a moral economy that fits our era. One that uh, has values and behavioral assumptions that are the ones we now hold as opposed to the ones of those who created supply side economics and neoliberalism. And we can make that happen. It's changed before it can change again. And the fact that we're in a moment when things are fraying and we're seeing discontent is an opportunity. Some horrible things are happening, but some wonderful things could happen. And I know you're all here because you see that opportunity and want to figure out what the next steps are. Any political economic framework enshrines reciprocal rights and obligations that link populations, governments, corporations, and all the other various organizations and stakeholders that make up society. Incorporated in a moral political economy are accepted justifications for the actions and power of government, employers, landholders, and financiers. Justifications based on widely shared values and beliefs. And we have to make those things explicit and get our laws and our rules in line with them. So the major achievement of neoliberalism, I would argue, and in fact all prevailing political economic frameworks since Adam Smith's, is really to make it seem like their descriptive accounts their, their, their descriptive accounts are the way it actually is. They, believe in the, they make us believe that the system is natural, but that's just a parlor trick. We can change that system and make it reflect better values. And it can be remade constantly, or not constantly, but regularly in some way that makes sense. So let me take you into contemporary world and behavioral economics and others who have been really giving us new insights on behavior. I'm proud that Danny Kahneman and Richard Thaler were both fellows at one time at the Center for Advanced Study in Behavioral Sciences, and both of them credit um, our institution as being critical in the development of that approach. But they've made us realize that um, particularly the Kahneman and Tversky work has really made us realize how imperfect we are as decision makers. So the underlying assumption of uh, perfect decision making that we can figure out our maximands and get there with perfect tools, it's clearly in doubt. Um, we also know from Eleanor Ostrom, who won the no only woman who's won the Nobel Prize in economics, and she's not an she was not an economist, but a political scientist and a friend, uh, a mentor of mine. We also know that people are social and creative beings and that we can build that into our model, that we should have in models that are interactive among people as opposed to narrowly self-interested maximizers, that we're social, we care about others. And why can't we build a foundation and a set of models built on those assumptions? And if we just look around, we don't have to go to the people who've done the science. If we just look around, we observe that a populace responds not only to material changes in their status, though they obviously care and should care about their material well-being, 
but they sometimes care about things that are actually and absolutely in contradistinction to their narrow self-interest. Um, whether you want to call that altruism, whether you want to call that soci sociality, I don't care. But there are all kinds of ways in which we reveal, in all kinds of instances, not that, that we're, be, we're more than that self-interested homo economicus. And we care about wounds to our dignity, about uh, violations of norms, a whole variety of things that were not really part of that model, of the last model. Okay, so here is what I want. <laughs> it, this is Lauren Setti's uh, painting on the walls, wall, City Hall of Siena uh, from the 14th century. And he has a mural on good government and a mural on bad government. And what I really want, and a lot of political scientists, I have to say, have used this as covers of their book, um, of one book or another. I think I have one that has it, too, um, which was on trustworthy government or something. So what I want is a teched up version of this world one that actually has bathrooms inside, running water, all those things. But the image still holds, right? This is a place where we don't need high walls. <laughs> um, we can close them if we absolutely need to, if the invading hordes are actually coming. But mostly we can be out in the streets and outside the walls, cultivating our fields, as it were, but doing the things we want to do dancing, being uh, creative in a variety of ways. So we need um, good governance structures as well as economic structures. And we must change our institutions, and I've given you some examples of institutions that have changed or that could be designed and built, so that they respond and reflect, respond to and reflect the, the needs of more of the population, of all of the population. So what we're doing at the Center for Advanced Study in Behavioral Sciences, um, infelicitously known as CASBIS, um, is to try to generate a new moral political economic framework by creating a large network of people. Glenn's been there. I think some of the others of you have been in conversations as part of this network um, in an effort to find, to build that framework. It's not probably going to come out of the head of one great theorist in this day and age. It's probably going to be more of a collective building of a whole bunch of ideas, a lot of experiments, trying things out. But we really need to do that work to build those, those ideas of what those institutions need to look like and what, that, what the economic building blocks are. So this is a really important conference for doing work in that direction, and I encourage you all to really do that work now. Thank you. Thanks. So there is, there is quite a bit there, and, and obviously overlaps with uh, radical exchange and radical markets if you if you open um, the preface of Radical Markets, actually, um, Milton Friedman is quoting there, and he's, he talks about the 19th century liberals um, as radicals questioning the institutions, and he uses it to justify uh, an evolution into um, basically what became post-World War II uh, um, institutions. And, but what's to stop that evolution from continuing, right? and that questioning to, con to continue. And, um, and it starts with the principles that Margaret laid out. So thank you so much for that, that speech. Um, so we are gonna move on to breakout sessions again. And uh, one in particular that a few folks wanted uh, us to mention um, was we do have the director of Poverty Inc. Um, here and we're gonna have a screening of the prize winning doc documentary, uh, Pover Poverty Inc. And so we, we sometimes take for granted, um, maybe not everyone in this room, um, but certainly in wide narratives, um, that uh, philanthropy is certainly for the good. And of course, that's where it comes from. 
but then there's questions of how has that industry grown? Um, is the business of doing good uh, one that has never had it better? And so uh, we, we, we think that's a great um, overlap of what we're doing here. So the screening will be followed by a discussion, as I mentioned, with um, Michael Matheson Miller. And he's a research fellow and director at Acton uh, uh, Media Acton Institute. So um, that's one of our breakouts for everyone else who uh, sees something else in their agenda booklets that they'd like to attend. Um, once again, we welcome you to uh, find your rooms and uh, find your conversation and enjoy it. <laughs>